It's July the 27th, 2021. In a drab conference room in a building in central London, a former health secretary is handed a Bible. Please state your full name. Uh, my full name is Kenneth Harry Clark. Take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence that I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. You were asked to reflect on the government's response to the risks posed by infected blood and blood products. You say, as a department, I believe we acted as swiftly and as efficiently as we were able, given the clinical and legal advice made available to us. Does that remain your view, Lord Clark? Yes. Is it right to understand then that in terms of your own perspective looking back, you have not identified any lessons to be learnt from the infected blood crisis? No, I haven't. Uh, I mean, I've obviously <laughs> improved my knowledge better now than it was two and a half minutes ago. A full-scale public inquiry is underway, and a former Prime Minister takes the stand. Unless somebody was being completely malign, it was a lack of scientific knowledge of what people were doing that ensured that people were fed this infected blood. But questions remain. I'm afraid that institutions and the state close ranks uh, around a lie sometimes and I think that's what's happened in this case. From the early 1970s an estimated 5,000 NHS patients were given contaminated blood products that infected them with diseases like hepatitis and HIV. Since then Half of these people have died. So how did this happen? How did the NHS, while supposedly delivering life-saving treatment to thousands of patients, actually deliver them a death sentence? After decades of campaigning, a public inquiry was finally launched, and this autumn, it will publish its final report. You're listening to Stories of Our Times from The Times and The Sunday Times. I'm Manveen Rana. Today, death in the blood, the most shocking scandal in NHS history. I'm Caroline Wheeler and I'm the political editor of The Sunday Times. Caroline, this is a very personal story for you. You've you've got a copy of the book you've just written about it on the desk, but this is a, a story that you have followed for a long time. Just take us back to where it began for you. Well, it began right at the very beginning of my career. I mean, literally at the very beginning of my career. This was in 2001, and I'd been given a place on the Trinity Mirror trainee scheme in Birmingham and one of the very first phone calls that I ever took into the newsroom there were always these things called ring-ins and they were always a bit of a kind of initiation test sort of dealing for the first time with the great British public I had this uh, amazing phone call from a guy called Mick Mason he called straight through to the newsroom and it got the call got passed on to me And it was this 34-year-old who was telling me that he had been infected with hepatitis C, HIV, and he now feared that he had been infected with the human version of the mad cow disease, which was all in the news at the time. Oh, God. And started telling me this absolutely unbelievable story about how he'd been infected by contaminated blood products. And this is one of your first days on the job. You know, when you're hearing this... First days on the job. What are you thinking? I'm thinking this is a conspiracy theorist. This is somebody that 
is trying to catch me out or has been put up to it by the news desk. And I came off the phone call and started doing a bit of research into this particular subject. And although what he told me is the stuff of nightmares, actually every word of it turned out to be true. It was such an eye-opener to me at that time. I was only 21 years old. And to be told such an absolutely horrific story, I found absolutely astonishing that this wasn't on the front page of every newspaper that this had occurred. And yet all I could really find was snippets of information on the internet. And for you, this begins a two-decade journey pursuing this story. Just take us back to to Mick, though, the man who who phoned in. So Mick was a haemophiliac, and and this story affects mainly haemophiliacs, but not exclusively haemophiliacs. And haemophilia basically means that you have a coagulation factor that's missing from your blood, which has to be supplemented using blood products uh, in order to ensure that your blood clots Mm. when you've had a knock or a bum. Haemophiliacs need to have this coagulation factor in order to not basically bleed to death, which is a very real concern for haemophiliacs that this could happen. Um, And Mick found out when he was 18 that he'd been infected with HIV, having received these contaminated blood products. So these are blood products he's given in order to make his blood coagulate to stop it being too thin he's actually being supplemented yeah exactly so the very drugs that ostensibly are being given to him to save his life to ensure that he doesn't suffer a life-threatening bleed in this blood factor is hiv and he is infected with hiv but he doesn't know he's infected with it and Actually, the way in which he discovers that he's been infected with HIV is, again, another jaw-dropping episode in this story. In that, At 18 years old, he's sent a diet sheet by his doctors advising him on the best types of food to be eating uh, for individuals that have been infected with HIV. That's how he finds out? That's how he finds out. And this is not a one-off. Of all the individuals that I spoke to for the book, many of whom had been either co-infected with HIV and hepatitis C or had one or the other, the stories were similar in almost every occasion that they were diagnosed with these infections but were not told for a substantial period of time. And also, they received these blood products, but were not warned of the risks, even though the risks were well known, which raises really profound questions about what was going on during this period. It's shocking. And then you say that Mick wasn't unusual. I mean, do we have a sense of how many people ultimately were infected with contaminated blood? How many people's lives were changed by this? So the estimates put it around 5,000 people. It's known as the worst treatment disaster in NHS history. And of those 5,000, more than half have now died. And the scale of it is is not really known. It could well exceed that because it also affected non-haemophiliacs, some of those who were given blood products during routine blood transfusions, for example, if there'd been a car crash or during childbirth. And it's estimated that around 35,000 people, in addition to the haemophiliacs that were infected, wow were also infected, particularly with hepatitis C during this period. Just take us back a step. I mean, how exactly do we end up with contaminated blood in the NHS? I mean, where does, where does this begin? Well, it's really a sort of story of medical advancements, really. In the 1960s, Dr Judith Graham Poole discovered a process of freezing and thawing plasma so that they could get a kind of rich layer of factor-rich plasma that could be used to transfuse haemophiliacs. And that was... That factor, is this the stuff that coagulates the blood? That's exactly right. So as I mentioned before, particularly in haemophiliacs, they're missing this coagulation factor. Mm. And the coagulation factor for haemophiliacs of haemophilia A is factor 8. And after this discovery of how this plasma could be frozen and thawed, this led to more advancements in the treatment of haemophilia. So you've got an amazing period of amazing discoveries that could transform the way haemophiliacs in particular live. How does that lead to contaminated blood? So putting it simply... You just couldn't make enough of this stuff in Mm. the UK. 
demand very quickly outstrips supply. There is a real clamour for this life-changing plasma. And indeed, the UK has never been self-sufficient in this ever since the start of this process. So not enough people. Not enough people. So it meant that often the establishment turned to places like America, which had a very different donation system to the UK and was based on people being paid to give donations. And there was a really obvious warning about some of the horrors that were to come right the way back in 1975. A World in Action investigator spent four weeks visiting plasma centres, selling plasma, talking to donors and examining safeguards. Tonight, World in Action investigates the health risk to Britain's haemophiliacs from the men who sell their blood in America. So World in Action went, there were 24 Highland clinics across the United States. These are the clinics that take blood? That's correct. It focused on one in San Jose near San Francisco. Mm. And the film crew turned up and saw and witnessed individuals often down and outs, drug addicts Mm. and alcoholics were on a kind of list of individuals where it was deemed to be a a risk, particularly of hepatitis, for example. and, And so it was deemed that they should not give blood. But often the rules were completely ignored. By offering to sell plasma in five Highland centres, we established even more disturbing facts. One, no check was made on the false addresses we gave. This can admit down and outs, a high hepatitis risk. Two, Highland doctors did not always carry out the only checks that can detect drug users. Drug users are among the highest risk for hepatitis. Three, physical examinations were not always done fully, though certified as such. Four, certain medical questions were not asked, but were filled in as having been answered satisfactorily. It became a really established practice, particularly on Skid Row, for people to go and do this, so much so that there was even a kind of nickname given to it, which was ooze for booze. So people would go and ooze, give blood, to get the money to pay for the booze. And the story kind of gets worse from there, really, which was it wasn't just people that were being paid to give blood on the streets, there were also setups within prisons where inmates were paid up to $7 for a pint of blood, which was then pooled with other blood. And that was where it became really dangerous. Pooled. It was pooled. So all the blood was mixed together and then made into the fact concentrate, which meant effectively if one oh. batch of blood had been infected with any of these diseases... So if then, any one person out of that pool... Yeah was infected, then the entire batch became infected. That's astonishing. I mean, that world in action came out in 1975. So people in Britain, they knew there was not the same sort of screening. When did it start coming into the NHS? Well, it was there at that particular time. And it didn't stop? In the time, in 1975, there was reports in some of the medical journals in the United Kingdom that a group of haemophiliacs had been infected with hepatitis. The issue had been around one particular maker of Factor 8, and that Factor 8 had come in from the United States. So for anybody to argue that the risks were not known about at that time is completely for the birds. That warning in 1975 was one of a whole host of warnings about the impact of contaminated blood and it entering the NHS supply chain. And back then, once it's come into the NHS, you know, as you say, it's not only haemophiliacs who are being given the factor eight. I mean, I I was really surprised to read that uh, Anita Roddick, for example, was one of the early patients who, who was who was given it. I mean, t- tell us a bit about her story. Yeah, I mean, lots of people kind of don't remember that bit about Anita Roddick's death. Anita Roddick was obviously the founder of the body shop. She was one of the of Britain's richest people at the height of her empire. Great female entrepreneur. And a great female entrepreneur. And she allegedly, and it, it's only ever been claimed that this was the case, was infected in 1971. So she would have been one of the first cases. And she believes or her family believe that she was infected when she gave birth to her daughter Samantha but she didn't find out for another 30 years and it was only when she was having some medical tests done that it was actually flagged that she did have hepatitis C and she quickly became fairly vocal about it became a member of the hepatitis C trust and talked about the fact that she had by that point got cirrhosis of the liver and it's important to remember with hepatitis C that it can stay dormant for a very long time, attacking the liver without anybody 
knowing about it, which is why we're never really going to know the true scale of this tragedy, because still today there could be people who were infected who have no idea that they were infected, but it will be silently eroding their liver function. Wow. And for Anita Roddick, who did did die young, tragically, for her family, they think this, factor eight, contaminated blood, was part of the problem. So I spoke to her daughter, Samantha, several years ago about it, and her daughter very much equates her early demise with this transfusion that she received. And she actually thinks it's, you know, incredibly sad given Anita Roddick's commitment to looking at the supply chains and making sure that there were ethical supply chains in the production of goods for the body shop that actually she herself died because of the contamination of the blood supply chain. Wow. And as you say, you know, she was given the factor eight during childbirth, but a lot of the people who did get it around that era were haemophiliacs, many of them children. Yes. The most shocking part of this story for me has been the way in which particularly children were effectively experimented on by haematologists during this period in order to work out whether these blood products were infected with deadly diseases. And there are memos, which I've included in the book, which shows that these individuals were knowingly being tested on. So in in January 1982, Professor Bloom, who is one of the key haematologists that's been involved in the treatment of haemophiliacs and actually plays a very important role in this story, He wrote a letter that basically confirmed that haemophiliacs were being experimented on. This is what Bloom wrote. Although initial production batches may have been tested for infectivity by injecting them into chimpanzees, it is unlikely that the manufacturers will be able to guarantee this form of quality control for all future batches. It is therefore very important to find out by studies in human beings to what extent the infectivity of the various concentrates had been reduced. The most clear-cut way of doing this is by administering those concentrates to patients not previously exposed to large pool concentrates. And of course those that were not previously exposed were, were generally children, which is why when there's been analysis done of this particular tragedy, around a third of those that were infected with HIV were children. I mean, this is jaw-dropping. You don't really imagine scientists thinking like that. You don't imagine medics sort of thinking it's cheaper to experiment on children. How exactly did they go about doing that? Well... There were a number of trials that were done during the course of these infectivity trials. The one that stands out for me was a trial which took place again in in 1982. There was a school that is in Alton in Hampshire, which has become known as the School of Death. The College and Trust were founded over 75 years ago by Sir William Purdy Trelaw, Lord Mayor of London to alleviate the suffering of the little cripples of the City of London, to educate and to train them. Today, Lord Mayor Trelaw College is the largest independent co-educational boarding school of its kind in the country, devoted entirely to the needs of disabled boys and girls. From the 50s onwards, it became a place and a magnet for children with haemophilia, simply because it was much easier to manage the condition when there was a health centre on site. And in 1982, there was a trial done at this particular school, which involved 50 school children by one particular pharmaceutical company. And I have been told that of the 50 children who were involved in that particular trial, all 50 of them were infected with HIV. These are children with haemophilia already. They're at a school for special care and instead they're being infected by HIV while they're there. Have have you managed to speak to any of them? So I've spoken to, to quite a number of them. The story that I have chosen to tell in the Sunday Times with the launch of the book is the story of Aid Goodyear. 
Aid Goodyear, who you wouldn't believe is the most cheerful, upbeat human being you could possibly ever imagine, given such tragedy has befallen him. He found out in 1985 that he had been infected with HIV in the most extraordinary way. He was summoned to the health centre on a very beautiful sunny afternoon in May 1985. There were five of them, him and his schoolmates, called in to see the director of haematology at the centre called Dr Aronstam. And as they were gathered, one of the nurses that was with them started weeping. Aid was told that he had been given HIV as Dr Aronstan pointed to the boys and told them which one of them had been affected or hadn't been infected with the words, you have, you haven't, you have, you haven't. And the last time he uttered the words, you have, it was when Dr Aronstan was pointing at Aid. And that's how Aid found out that he had HIV. In the headmaster's study, in front of other boys. Yeah. And actually, one of the saddest things that I know from what AIDS told me since is that although they were not all told that day that they'd been infected with HIV, they did all subsequently get infected. And AIDS is the only one alive today. What's actually happened to the school that was known as the School of Death? Is it, was it shut down after that? The school is still there. It's still there. It's it's no longer the magnet that it was for haemophiliacs, but it's still there. There is a class action which has been taken by some of the former pupils against the school. But the school believes that it didn't fail in its duty of care, but that the liability for what happened to these students rests with the NHS. Caroline... You told us earlier about some of the experiments that were being carried out by medics at the time, by Dr Bloom in particular. You mentioned a very renowned haematology expert back then. One of the final chapters in your book is just called Colin. Tell us a bit about his story. So Colin Smith was infected with HIV when he was just two years old. He was a previously untreated patient. He was infected, or certainly he found out that he'd been infected with HIV in 1983. And what is most shocking about Colin's story to me is that one month prior to him being infected, Professor Bloom, who was in charge of his treatment, had actually issued a new memo to the kind of haematology community, advising them to stop using the factor eight imported factor eight because they knew of the HIV risk. It's never been explained why Colin was given factor eight, particularly because he hadn't needed it in the past. It was for a routine operation for grommets on his ears. And so there had been no need for him to be given that. So the only conclusion that his parents can really come to is that he was one of these unwitting guinea pigs and he was infected as part of that systemic program of trying to find out whether the blood was still dangerous. And he's infected a month after his physician has told people to stop infecting other people with with That's correct. That's correct. And Colin's story is the one that breaks my heart the most. He weighed less than a a six-month-old baby when he died. He'd been completely emaciated He used to have to be lifted up in a sheepskin to stop him from being injured by his parents. And when they came to take him home from the hospital because he was dying for his last Christmas, the doctors tried to stop him from being taken home because they told his parents that no undertaker would take his body because he had HIV. And all the time, while this absolutely horrific set of events was engulfing this family who were tending to a very, very poorly child. They were having AIDS daubed on their door and being subjected to abuse and harassment and ostracised by the community around them at the very time when they needed them more support than ever before. And I I just find that so painful. I just find that, that just so painful. Was there ever 
any sense of Dr. Bloom, the physician who administered the factory to Colin? Was he ever held to account? No, not really. He's he's no longer um, around. He he died some time ago, and but but there has been some retrospective thinking about his role. The unit that was once named after him, his name has now been removed from that unit, and the bust of him that was there has also been taken down. So there has been the hospital where he worked, where he worked in Cardiff. So there has been a kind of acceptance of his role in the scandal. Caroline, you have been bringing these stories to light for years. And the reason many of us managed to hear the accounts, you know, the personal testimony of people like Colin's parents was because there has been a big public inquiry into infected blood. How did that inquiry finally come about and what was your role in it? Well, for a start, we never thought we'd get this far. And really the breakthrough came in the most surprising of ways to me. We'd been sort of building a campaign and a consensus. And I say we, myself and Diana Johnson, who's the Labour MP for Hull North and also the co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group on haemophilia and contaminated blood. Mm. And we'd been sort of working away on the political parties for many years trying to get them to put a commitment to holding a public inquiry into the various manifestos. And in 2017, we had quite a few manifestos that were signed up to the notion of a public inquiry, including, crucially, the DUP. But obviously, you know, in 2017, for a large portion of the Conservative Party campaign, Theresa May, who was the Prime Minister at the time, was 20 points ahead in the polls. And the prediction had been that she was going to sweep to a landslide victory. Yeah. But as you will remember, things didn't quite go to plan for mm. the Conservative Party. Uh, at the end of the day, Theresa May lost her majority and she was propped up by the DUP. I recently changed newspapers and I'd come to join the Sunday Times And one of the first times I'd gone back into Parliament after that election, I bumped into Diana Johnson and we were talking about contaminated blood and where the campaign was going to go next. And I I just sort of casually mentioned to her that I thought we now had a majority for a public inquiry because we had had the support of the DUP. Mm. And then I sort of said to Diana, well, you know, we could get a letter together perhaps and try and get all the leaders of the parties that are in support of a public inquiry to sign a letter to the Prime Minister and try and, you know, bounce them into it. And Diana thought about it. She said, leave it with me. Within a, a couple of days, she duly, and to her full credit, came back with a letter that was signed by all the party leaders And, yeah, it's quite funny that really the story that I'm most proud of in my journalistic career was a 350-word story on page four of the Sunday Times, (laughs) which made reference to this letter. And just several weeks after Theresa May was returned to Downing Street, it was about two hours before Theresa May was due to stand up and address the Commons on the issue, and I got a phone call. And it was this Prime Minister's special advisor saying, would you take a call from the Downing Street switchboard? Yes, I would. Uh, A guy called Tim Smith came on the phone and he just said the words that I will never forget uh, as I was standing in Portcullis House. Congratulations, two weeks into your new job and you've got your public inquiry. And that public inquiry has been underway now for some time. Were there any moments in it that really startled you? So many moments and just so much, you know, I think the powerful testimonies were just unbelievably emotional, some of them. Were you told anything about any risks associated with the use of the Factor 8 product? No, nothing at all. Were you told anything about differences between NHS products or American products? It was never spoken about. We just believed the doctor. You know, they were treating Colin, and it sounds terrible, but he was like a god to us, Prof Bloom, because he was looking after my son. So why would I ask any questions about We thought he was getting the best treatment possible. Colin and Jan Smith, the parents of Colin Smith, their evidence was the most powerful evidence I've seen. 
I could cope with uh, death, but not with the death of my son. I still have trouble today, the fact that he's in a grave on his own. And the guilt will never go away. But also moments where there was fury in the inquiry, the evidence of Ken Clark. Given the medical knowledge at the time, did anyone behave carelessly or negligently? And all I can say is personally, insofar as areas I, I've now seen or I've been involved in, no, I don't think anybody, I can't, I can't see anything where I think anybody in the department should have acted differently. And, anyway, and the slightly I, nonchalant way in which he delivered his response to the inquiry, you know, really sent shockwaves through the inquiry room too. And, and everything, the whole everything depends. It's true of all these inquiries, which we now set up so regularly. With hindsight, of course you can see things that we would do and would have done had we known the eventual outcome. And they obviously did not realise that I think a score now is almost 3,000 people were eventually, sadly, going to die. If they'd known that, they would have stopped Factor Eight straight away. I mean, and as I you mentioned Ken Clark there. Was there more that governments in the interim could have done? The one thing that would have been a game changer would have been if we'd reached self-sufficiency in terms of the blood products that we made in the United Kingdom. And David Owen, who again is is one of the heroes of the piece in this, who was the health minister in 1975 Mm. when this burgeoning health crisis was emerging, was very clear that we needed to put in the infrastructure and the money to make sure that we became self-sufficient, but it never happened. And with the public inquiry, it stopped taking evidence last February. Do we know roughly when they'll be publishing their conclusions? I'm hearing at the moment that we think the inquiry will come back in early November, but it could be sooner. But I think because they had to take additional evidence, I think it will be later than we'd expected, which had originally been forecast to be October. During the course of writing this book... There are around 10 sort of characters that I've used to tell the story of the infected blood scandal. Um, And two of them died uh, in the very short period of time it took for me to write this book. One was uh, a guy called Nick Sainsbury, and he died in April. He'd given evidence to the inquiry and obviously will never see the findings of it. And the second was John Corns, and he also died in April. He had given evidence to the inquiry and he will never find out how it ended. it does feel like they are slowly dying out. And that's especially put into kind of stark focus when the statistics point to the fact that one haemophiliac is dying every four days of contaminated blood poisoning. What they want is answers and a sense of justice before it's too late. People don't realise just what this thing has done to people. You know, took lives, maimed people. You know, they're crippled with, you know, such horrible things. We need justice. We need something done about this. been listening to Stories of Our Times, a podcast brought to you thanks to the subscribers of The Times and The Sunday Times, with me, Manveen Rana, and my guest, political editor for The Sunday Times, Caroline Wiener. And if you missed her on the podcast last week talking about her huge scoop on the suspected Chinese spy in Westminster, please do go back and have a listen. Her book, Death in the Blood, the inside story of the NHS contaminated blood scandal, comes out this week. This episode was produced by Taryn Siegel. The executive producer is Kate Ford, and sound design was by David Crackles. If you can, please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow.